This is Ross Coulthard, and you are listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and I am joined for a breakdown as things may be beginning to heat up a little bit this cold September uh, by Dan. Dan, welcome. Howdy, howdy. I hope things do heat up. It is freezing here in the UK. (laughs) It is rather chilly, but the UFO topic may not be done. Um, so very, but you know what? I have to say first off, Dan. A uh, little mention to Robert Bob Wood, who passed away, ninety six years old, UFO researcher. Um, his son Ryan Wood was a guest on the show a few months back, talking about uh, his book Magic Eyes Only. Ryan's due to come back on the show in, a, in the next week or so, anyway, to discuss his, his follow up book and a little bit more and i think it'd probably be a good idea then to to talk about his dad and his dad's work because they did work together on nj12 yeah. documents and things like that um but yeah i never had the pleasure of speaking to to robert wood or I'm, I'm actually not overly familiar with his work either probably am indirectly um however yeah just a little sad point because it's one of those things it's a lot of ufo researchers have been doing this for so long that kind of times up and 96 a great run so fair play. Oh, that's an amazing run and yeah you're you're right like we stand on the shoulders of giants like him and other people who have passed and it's always worth acknowledging that this takes a village you know we, we couldn't be here today without people like that yeah so um yeah very sad news uh and uh wish ryan and family all the best and have ryan back on in a couple of weeks to discuss his work and his father's work as well um but dan lots to crack on with uh, some news items um i was going to start off first asking obviously I had the interview with Luella zondo a few days ago um and just your, your thoughts on anything lewis said not just the interview i done but anything he said in between then or or whatever else so thoughts yeah they, there were quite a few things in, in your interview with lou actually uh that was interesting uh first of all and i guess i can pull a little bit of news into it that we might talk about later um lou talking about trying to be positive with arrow the mm. you know it's run by humans and humans are fallible and sure Kirk patrick hasn't done the best job but now there's a new head that we'll talk about at some point in this and we've got to give them a chance and hopefully they can write that ship and and i like lou's attitude there uh most of news from dan there folks arrow run by humans <laughs> arrow run by humans <laughs> yeah. oh, breaking news um but yeah it's just worth remembering you, you know like the the members change and uh we we can essentially get a do-over hopefully hopefully with yeah. with this one um loved what you spoke to uh about the the micro technology and that yeah. how Lou kind of pulled that into talking about whether viruses are alive i i think that's really important to to acknowledge because it may not be little gray men, you, you know, and when we find life in the universe, other intelligent life, it may not even be recognizable to mm. even us now, you know, if we find it in 100 years or 50, whatever, um, it could be microbes that are collectively a hive mind or something like that. And we, we've really got to start thinking outside of these boxes uh, if we want to kind of solve this problem. Um, really interesting that Lou was talking about leaks when you asked him if there was going to be any more kind of like tic tac leaks and things like that and and he said probably not it doesn't need to happen anymore because we we've, we've kind of shored up that chain of command and how the information and he hopes kind not, of doesn't he actually that. said yeah. hope not. Like he doesn't want that to be yeah absolutely and it, it's clear Luke wants this handled properly uh by by the powers that be and i think that's you know totally fair enough uh but i i would say that the the rust is kind of being knocked off that process as he said and we're, we're getting to a point i mean even corbell and nap when they brought out certain videos have said you know this information isn't getting to where it needs to go to to properly be investigated and appreciated and if we don't have the data we can't protect ourselves or the airspace or people you know so yeah i, I think that that's an important point there um the sorry there's one more bit towards the end uh where you asked him about the the nazca mummies mm. and he spoke about pretty much kind of echoing our points really when we've spoken about it about how when you sensationalize something up front it makes the conversation more difficult kind of down the line and yeah we we said that that was true of the nazca mummies and and it's it's nice to see him kind of paying attention to that and having a mind for that you, you know because the way that you present if you ask someone about ufos and you let them talk about it 
you'll have a good conversation. If you ask someone if they believe in aliens from these reticuli, you're going to have a different conversation. Yeah. So framing those kind of conversations is really important. Um, you also touched on speaking to him about Stratton, which was really interesting. Um, yeah. and he's full of praise for, for uh, Jay Stratton, who he worked with at the UAP task force. Um, and there's a little bit of news to talk about with that. So I'm really excited to kind of see how that rolls out. Lou never speaks about other people's experiences. And he mentioned during your interview that there were people's stories that were really important that we haven't heard that yet. And it's not his place to talk about. So I'm really excited to kind of get to those stories and hear them. Um, disappointed that we'll never see the 23 minute video. But yeah. are you surprised? Like, I'm disappointed, but also not surprised, you know? Nah, n not not when you hear that it's got sensitive nuclear or whatever in the background. Like, I think I get when it's uh, like a Tic Tac video or a gimbal video, we can be annoyed we don't see more because it's over water. So you can't tell where that is. That could be water anywhere. It could be Loch Ness for all we know, right? Um, clearly not. But all you have to do is take off the, the sensor data around the sides or even take a snapshot of just the, the object and you could show the rest of the film. And that shouldn't give away any more detail. But if you've got things in the background of those videos, like a North Korean nuclear facility, or, you know, it's clearly Moscow, for example, then that's a different story. And as much as, you know, me having the authority, I'd be like, yeah, release it, do it. I don't care. You know, that's not my problem. I get why that won't come out. But there must be plenty more content available what i am surprised we haven't had yet um which i suppose is in with that leak stuff is more footage from pilots on their phones because remember this was a thing a couple of years ago wasn't it when when some of those legislations or um things were signed was it just the navy or the air force as well encouraging pilots to report and use their own phones to film some of this stuff because yeah, then that so bypasses like any well. classified, you know, your iPhone, your Samsung, whatever it may be, isn't a classified bit of kit. Maybe it is if it's military use and you're in a jet, whatever. But, you know, you can just film something next to your craft and maybe we would see something from there. Then again, some of that stuff does appear online and we get it dismissed as could be video game stuff, as nonsense, as CGI. There's probably at least one of those clips that has been dismissed, which actually is genuine. Do you know yeah. the one I always hope is? Go on. You know, you know the one where it looks like someone's filming from inside like an airliner because the the the, the glass is frosted, uh -huh. and you see the saucer type object come up at the window and kind of rise up past off. Oh, I know the one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and people always go, "That looks too good to be true." And you're like, "Well, what if that is the one?" That's <laughs> yeah. the one I'd always love to be like. That's the video. That's the video. Um, and and surely smooth looking as well. There's so there's such a lack of detail on the object but we hear that's what they look like smooth no seams all that kind of stuff you know so meh yeah and and surely when we see a bit of footage that's real it is gonna look too good to be true because yeah. it's gonna look a little weird to us right um all, all of the stuff we talk about with ufos comes from experiences so it makes sense and just because you can hoax something it doesn't mean that it's never real in a video yeah so uh yeah that's it's interesting with like the advent of AI and stuff like that, making it easier to to produce these videos as well. And it's going to make sure. it really hard to discern good, yeah. genuine stuff. If in the last few years, folks have thought scrolling through social media and videos, you know, look too good to be true. Some of the stuff that's coming out now looks unbelievable. Although some of it's still pretty ropey. Like I saw one where it's Gordon Ramsay in a kitchen but then his food turns into like a unicorn or something in the middle of <laughs> moving a pan and all that stuff's going to be wonderful when it's proper <laughs> artists and, and experts using this to, to create movies, TV shows, games, whatever it might be. Um, but it's going to be like borderline dangerous in the wrong hands because, yeah, there's again, it's always that thing from Bicentennial Man. I've, I've said this before. When the guy's making Robin Williams face, he says the secret to perfection is imperfection. And that's something that I think is always struggled with in terms of CGI, where sure. things look too perfect and too real. Um, yeah. And you, you don't get that realism because it looks too good. And you hear that complaint about modern music as well, that stuff is overproduced because, you know, the drums are all tightened up and nothing's like slightly out of tune and things like that. And listening to music from back in the day, 
you know, you hear a bum note every now and then and yeah. it just humanizes things, you know? So yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, so off the back of some of that stuff, so Dan said there was a few good points of my interview with Lou. The rest was shit. Um, some of those, Dan, there are, <laughs> there, are, there are talking points off the back of. So the new Arrowhead, see what I've done there? Um, so taking over from interim boss Tim Phillips, you've got Dr. John T. Koslowski. He is the new full-time director of Arrow. He's got a background in quantum optics and crypto mathematics. He has led NSA, National Security Agency. I believe that's the right thing uh, research teams and a pentagon press release uh, last week when he was appointed or kind of 10 days ago now um, they said that the new appointment will aim to minimize technical and intelligence surprise by synchronizing scientific intelligence and operational detection identification attribution and mitigation of unidentified anomalous phenomena uap in the vicinity of national security areas under his leadership, Arrow will continue to examine the U.S. government historical record relating to UAP, as well as efforts to declassify and release UAP-related records to the greatest extent possible. Um, so, yeah, um, not a lot known about the guy at the moment. Um, I think it's like, is, is it a case of following on from Kirkpatrick to Phillips now to Kozlowski? that it's third time lucky. I think Tim Phillips was babysitting basically for six months. Yeah. Probably. Um, so I don't think you can pin anything on Tim Phillips. He was just overseeing that. Um, I imagine he had multiple other jobs and roles to do at the same time. He was you know, looking after Arrow, um, treading water. But does Arrow still have a role to play in this? I was surprised Lou Elizondo said the same. And I think Gary Nolan on Twitter, again, similar, saying hopefully Arrow can do something is there still a chance that Arrow has any positive impact on any kind of disclosure process? Or is it still, we're going to be here in a year's time with more reports poo-pooing the subject, nothing being done, and a new director, or we get a whole new department? I, I honestly don't know at this point. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, know, if anyone tells you they know about this stuff, they're, they're fibbing. Uh, you, you know, we can hope for the best, prepare for the worst uh, because of past experience. But... Koslowski was in the UAP task force. So he has a good kind of past with this stuff. You know, Lou and Lou and Stratton and people like that have always sung the praise of the UAP task force and kind of said that it went off the rails afterwards. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's hopeful. But then at the same time, the UAP task force wrote a classification guide for UAP kind of records and files and things like that, where they classified all the UAP stuff. Um, various sources have kind of said they're not entirely responsible for that, but the proof will be in the pudding, right? And there, there is an upcoming kind of calendar event schedule where we'll very much get to see if it's going to be the same thing or different. Um, on the back of that, then, uh, with the event, were you talking about the hearing? I am, yeah. Right, okay, cool. So I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll move on to my next. We'll come back to Jay Stratton because it's all sure. kind of tied in, to be fair. Um, is, yeah. So Ask a Paul's Matt Laszlo, again, one of the, I say few, I've got a few things I subscribe to. If, if there are people who I appreciate their research, their efforts, whatever it might be in making this, then I like to try and support back as well. And I do subscribe to Ask a Paul folks. So if you enjoy kind of on the ground, immediate boots, boots on the ground reporting, uh, Matt Laszlo is literally running about Washington chasing Literally. congressmen right. and women, senators <laughs> back and forward, speaking to them on trains and trams, whatever it might be. Um, I think jumping in the back of taxis with them at times <laughs> to, get, to get a comment from them. Um, he was speaking to Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and she has confirmed there is a UAP hearing scheduled for this month. So we should have a public UAP hearing in for this month. So um, initial thoughts, Dan, especially around the fact that Kirsten Gillibrand seemed to champion the UAP subject for a while, then seemed to go kind of cold on it. Maybe we, some of us filled the vacuum of silence there with her having lack of interest, but then I don't think it's unfair because she did make some comments that seemed to backtrack on having a real interest in progression, disclosure, whatever you want to call it. But is this a good thing? What Where are you at now with a public hearing? I think someone like Gillibrand strikes me as someone who, I mean, she's part of the government, you know, she she believes in due process and proper kind of organizations and, and leading. So I feel like once Arrow was established, she kind of put her faith in that. And that has been, you know, successful to varying degrees for depending on who you ask. But 
she's always sung Sean Kirkpatrick's praises, but in the interview with Ascapol, she seems to suggest that this upcoming hearing would be based around Arrow, uh, and that she wants them to show what they have, what they have identified, what they haven't identified, and she specifically said that she sees it as a chance to to build some credibility back up. So I'm hopeful that exactly what she said will happen. Uh, she also mentioned she wants the public to feed in sightings. So I feel like along with that, the fact that she is a co-sponsor of the UAP Disclosure Act again this year, not leading it like she was kind of, you know, with the other ones, but yep. uh, she signed on sponsoring it. We'll see if she kind of, you know, puts up when it comes to crunch time with that. But it sounds like she seems hopeful that this is going to be a productive hearing and that we're going to see a better side of Arrow um, that's not just, you know, marketing and rebranding and stuff like that. I remain positive. I love that she's interested. I, I think she brings a lot of credibility to it, as with as do like everyone that signed on. It remains a bipartisan bill. And hopefully the hearings are, are headed by some strong members of both parties to, to kind of demonstrate that. Uh, I, I'd like to see AOC uh, and people like that who were very interested in the government waste side of things and efficiency and so on and so forth, kind of, you know, being transparent with what they're spending. Uh, it could be really interesting. The, the first hearing that uh, I'm going to say AIMSOG, even though that's not <laughs> the, the it's hard oh, to pronounce, AOIMSG, yeah. uh, that office between the UAPTF and, and Arrow, that hearing was, excuse my French, a shit show. And it, it really showed kind of a, either purposeful obfuscation or just completely incompetence. And anything better than that would be an improvement for me. And I uh, think it was both. I think it was obfuscation through incompetence. And probably. I think Ray and Moultrie were put out there deliberately knowing less than they had to. Because if you want to like totally mess something like that up and say I'm, I'm the gatekeeper and I know folk underneath me or at least folks I can say, look, I'm going to th throw me a bone here. I'm going to put you out in front of those. And do you know what? Don't worry about how much or how little you know about this. Just just go and do it. Um, yeah. And no matter how badly it goes, it's fine. That's that. Ideally, that's it. So just go out and deny, 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 or be honest because you know nothing. And yeah. they've sat there and went, yeah, you know, complicit in the lie, but probably not lying to the extent that a lot of people thought they did. And end result was people went, yeah, nothing to it. Yeah. What was the very plausible deniability, isn't yeah. it? Uh, that's what you want. Uh, so they're not lying. They can never be brought up on charges of lying under oath or anything like that. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, previously, Askapol had said that they were hearing that there were two hearings in September. Yeah. So it seems like that's changed. Like I, I feel like one was going to be Arrow when it was spoke about before. One was going to be Arrow and one was going to be, you know, some whistleblowers or people yeah. that, you know, we wanted to go under oath. Um, it seems like that's changed, so we'll see if they happen or whether they're combined. Um, but something I loved that uh, Askapol asked one of the senators coming coming out of a meeting, uh, Heinrich, uh, I, f I forget the guy's first name, unfortunately, but he he had no idea what any of this was when, when Matt Laszlo from Askapol asked him. However, the next day, Heinrich had signed on as a co-sponsor to the UAP Disclosure Act. So... I wanted to emphasize that just to show how much just having the conversation with these senators impacts it. So call your senators, you know, go to uapcaucus.org and follow their kind of scripts and call your senators and, and let them know you want them to support this because you can really make a difference. Yeah. Um, what do you expect in suppose little discussion on it? Like, what do you realistically think can happen at this? I don't think we're going to get, you know, not going to get videos, not going to get whistleblowers. I don't think we're going to get any of that. Um, can you see it being pretty generic and due processy, or do you think we're going to get some meaty questions? And because obviously G Gillibrand in that first public one, she was pretty harsh, wasn't she? On was it Bray yeah. or Moultrie or who was the guy? No, that was. Do you remember she was going through someone where she was basically like, "You, sh your job is to know, so make sure you know for next time." She was pretty. Oh yeah, that's right. I think I think that was a, a hearing that was separate. It was like a. But it was brought up somewhere. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and it, whoever the guy him. was, he was quite new to like, his role. I don't um, know. And yeah. he dismissed it, didn't he? He was like, "Yeah, yeah." yeah. You have, and she was like, "Well, well, no. It's your job to know. I expect yeah. you to know." And he kind of he shit himself. He was like, "Oh God, you know." 
it was the old um Simpsons thing of the Pope, the, the pen. You know, well, that's not going to cut it with this Pope. And he goes, ho, oh. <laughs> um, it was a little bit like that, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't expect too much. I don't think this is going to be the damn breaking whistleblowers type thing, but I think if it can just push things forward a little bit more, then off the back of Lou Elizondo's book, this James Fox documentary. If we can get anything else from David Grush, maybe Grush is there. I don't know as part of it. Um, that would be nice to see. Uh, that'd be good. And I know you've still got your 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 Luna, your Rubio, Warners, Burchettes, whoever else is involved in that that group, pushing for potential field hearings on their own as well. So do they follow up with something, or does it get lost in the fact that we're getting closer to the elections now as well, and those? <laughs> those kind of big debates are taking center stage. It, it really surprised me, actually, that they're doing the hearing this month because it's so close to the elections. Yeah. I thought everything would be pushed back till afterwards and, you know, things were settled. It shows, you know, there's clearly importance and they're prioritizing this, which is great. I'm or, hopeful. Sorry, go on. Or devil's advocate, Dan. Mm -hmm. They they are getting it out of the way. Oh, getting out. Yeah, that's, that's true. Not to put well. a dampener on it, but just thinking of, other ways yeah. it could come across. No, you're you're totally right. Um, but I've got to I've got to wonder, you know, with with Lou's book and everything like that coming out, and the public interest in this being enormous, you know, those first hearings kind of echoed. They they were identified by time as like one of the hundred top moments of the year and stuff like that. People that I know who aren't interested in the UFO thing knew that they were doing UFO hearings and just thought it was weird and didn't bother watching. To see another one. Um, you know, after those historic first ones would just show a continuation of interest in this issue and, and would perk a lot of ears up, I think. What I'd love to see is not just something where they essentially repeat talking points from Arrow that we've seen in the past, you know, letting the public know this is how we kind of vet UFO sightings and this is what we do. I'd like to see a little more transparency around that process so that these kind of review boards that they use to to vet their solutions to cases aren't faceless and can yeah. be kind of held public account a little bit more. The fact that Gillibrand said she wants them to show what they have and haven't identified, I mean, that that could go two ways. It yeah. suggests to me that maybe we will see some video, but maybe we'll only see video for the cases that they have solved, you know? We're not going to see anything meaty that like that 23-minute video that was taken on classified sensors and stuff like that. I think we're more likely to see stuff like the video that we were shown in that first hearing where they struggle to kind of get the framing up and stuff like that. But hopefully with someone that knows how to use a computer this time. It was VLC Media Player, wasn't it? it Which was, is one yeah. of the easiest to use and one of the best free really softwares good. on the go. And they struggled to get that. Although that could also work the other way, Dan, where they accidentally put the wrong video on and the guy's like, oh no, that's the 23 minute video. Uh, just take it down. <laughs> uh, you never I mean, know. yeah. Human moments can go in our favor sometimes, right? Hundred um, percent. And uh, Jay Stratton, you've mentioned uh, when I was speaking to Lou Elizondo, has been a name that in the last couple of weeks has kind of come back to the forefront. He was speaking at Phenomicon um, in Utah alongside people like George Knapp, uh, Mika Hanks, and whatnot. I say that because they all played music on stage together. Some folks may have seen the clip of that. Um, but Jay Stratton was the was he the head of OSAP or one of the leaders of OSAP, fair to say? He, I, I guess we'll find out. Like, we've heard that he was the boss. We've yeah, heard that, that that's he fair. was yeah. like running point, I would say. That, yeah. That's kind of, yeah. He's mentioned in Lou Elizondo's book. He's a name that's been familiar with, with some researchers, especially for many years now, but coming more and more to the forefront. Um, and he has signed a deal with Harper Collins to publish his memoir, represented by Dan Farah. Um, it includes things like TV and movie rights, but that's just a common thing with any memoir that you would Dan, also Dan have Farrah's that. really involved, isn't he? Yeah, Dan Farah. Uh, and that, if this sounds familiar, folks, this is the exact same thing uh, from Lou Elizondo when he signed his deal with Harper Collins through Dan Farah. Exact same, exact same setup. Uh, Jay Stratton bringing forward his his memoir. There, there are rumors, and I suppose it's fair to say it needs to be rumors at this point because we've not really had Jay Stratton come out and talk, although. He's got a book. I've seen a few people rather pessimistically say, got a book deal, started tweeting. I think that was on the Discord. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was like, do you know what? It's fair enough, though, isn't it? But I imagine as, as part of 
um, as part of that book deal, you're probably told you have to send a couple of tweets and promote it as well, which just makes sense. Um, but there are, there are rumours or rumblings, and I asked Lou Elizondo about this, that Jay Stratton, who was involved with OSAP into ATIP before he moved on, um, potentially has a slightly different or a, a different version of events to Lou. Um, and there are some folks saying, well, this means Lou is lying. Well, this means Jay's disinformation. This means they're both lying. Who knows? Um, I think it's just a case of literally just guessing, Dan, speculation central at this point. That no, it's they, back. People can quote you. <laughs> people, yeah, people will quote me and take a little clip of my tech uh, audio and put it out anyway on video. That's what happens these days. Um, but I think it'll just be a case of they have slightly differing versions of some events. Um, that may be the passage of time. That may be just the way they remember them. Or maybe there are just some myth, mistruths in there for various reasons. And I think I've said from the get-go, I don't believe there's anyone involved at the official level in the UFO topic, especially from government, that for one reason or another hasn't lied about something at some point and not to say that it's it's malicious or nefarious but there may be reasons things weren't said when they were said and that's something dan actually i'll come back to um when in a couple of minutes when we talk about weaponized something george knapp said um on that um which was interesting so yeah what are your thoughts then on jay stratton's book coming out very similar to to lou elizondo's yeah i'm really excited um Really intriguing for me that Dan Farrow has cut his hands in all these pies because he's also involved in producing secret machines uh, from yeah. To The Stars. So he he just seems to be the producer of choice for these guys. And I wonder how involved he's been behind the scenes over the years, you, you know, kind of developing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, he's also he, producing the documentary that everyone yes. was talking about. What is this secret documentary? As was confirmed by Luis Elizondo, it's Dan Farrow producing that as well. Um, yeah. So he's an agent, producer extraordinaire to the to the ufo stars it seems now and a heavy hitter too you know if, if people listening have seen ready player one uh he, he produced that he worked with the earnest clients produce that and the, the guy is very successful so as far as someone that knows his way around hollywood to get these things done he seems to be the go-to guy um but I, i'd love to talk to him just to see how involved he he's been um for me the the interesting bit of the story is going to come kind of post OSAP and ATIP, but before mm -hmm. the UAP task force. There's kind of like a, a five or so year gap there where people like John Greenwald have uncovered documents that suggest that UAP were being investigated by the DOD kind of officially and across kind of the board, across a number of organizations through working groups before we heard these kind of official announcements. So I'm really curious about that and, and how deep that ran because it kind of shows the, the disparity between the information we're getting from the government and the information we're getting from the people who worked on this stuff for the government. And I, I think it's really important for, for the public to understand that whether you believe UAP or ET or whatever, the government has been mucking around with this stuff, covering yeah. things up, and that's not okay. So it doesn't matter which side of the conversation you're on here, we should all be expressing frustration with government officials who just aren't giving us the full truth here. And people like Jay Stratton and Louis, Louis Elizondo writing their books kind of gets it out and on record to a lot of people. And we know these days, most things come down to kind of popularity contests, right? Um, if they're not on people's minds, if they're not reaching people, then they're just not going to be spoken about. Lou's book got to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm hopeful that Jay Stratton's can do the same. Uh, Jay's been a little more elusive than Lou has, so that remains to be seen whether you know the clout is there. But I think anyone that read Imminent and was interested in Imminent would be interested in this book as well. It's got a huge publisher pushing it. So uh, yeah, I'm excited to see where it goes. It could essentially work as a as a... 2.0 to what Lou's kind of book started. I've also said a few times, Dan, that I get the feeling David Grush might have a book deal in the works. Possibly. And that could be why he's went quiet. And let's be fair, when these people sign these deals, uh, Jay Stratton won't be jumping out and doing interviews, I don't think, going forward. I wonder if Phenomicon was his last appearance of that kind until his book comes out. 
because they're generally told to do a, like a media blackout where, you know, get your book written. And that's the thing. We don't know how much of the book's done. If yeah. it's started, if it's just been signed, I'm guessing that's it just signed. Um, and he will now have, you're probably looking at what, a year, year and a half before we see the book? Probably, um, yeah. Potentially. Um, so, yeah, that'll be an interesting one. And then if David Grush puts out something or comes back out, um, I'm intrigued to see how that one goes in terms of pushing the conversation and whatever direction it's going to push it. I think yeah. it will give us at least a fuller picture of what was happening with OSAP to ATIP. And I think at that point, between Lukatsky speaking in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon and on his interviews with George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell, um, between Lou Elizondo's book and Jay Stratton's, we should have a relatively or as clear a picture of OSAP to ATIP that we're going to have. Yeah. And a whole load more, sorry, and a whole load more questions as well. Yeah, um, as always, right? Yes. <laughs> Answer one um, question and three rise in its place. Yeah, there was something that Jay that. said that um what was it he said in his announcement that the disclosure process has begun and yeah. i it was really curious phrasing right whether did you see me tweeting about that i did or, and or it was anything? a really good question because you said that wait it's begun now or it's going to begin or like when did it begin or it has begun yeah because I, I could i could see that as as that being really petty and slinging a bit of mud at Lou to say that, well, now it's actually official because I'm going to sort this out. Because that would look a bit... It does look a little bit like you're you're kind of underhandedly referencing, well, we have, or, or purposely ignoring, you've just had this big book come out talking about the very thing you're also going to write about as well, but from your perspective, um, completely validly as well. But that disclosure's begun now, seems like it could be a shot at that. And I would just like to see Jay Stratton clear that up to say, no, I just mean that th the whole process is underway and it includes all of this stuff. Or he comes out and says, no, I'm going to make sure the correct story is told, in which case then there is a definite disconnect between both. However, I would I would find that maybe more strange now, given they're involved with the same company, the same agent, you know, competing against each other. That doesn't sound like it would be would be right. Yeah. And and from Lou's book, it sounds like they were working in tandem everywhere anyway. You know, that Lou was kind of working on one piece of the pie and Jay was pushing it in other areas of government, you, you know, a, a good one too. But it also made me think of so Kurt Jaimungle interviewed Lou. Uh Kurt Jaimungle from Theories of Everything, that is, interviewed Lou. And there there were a number of really intriguing things said, but one that stuck out to me is Lou said Maybe the government are waiting to get a cue from public conversation. And we've spoken about this before, whether since, say, the 40s or whenever this began, have the government kind of tried to have this conversation and depending on the reaction of the public, either stopped or gone back to the drawing board. And Jay kind of saying, you know, the disclosure process has begun, along with Carl Nell's presentation at the Sol Foundation, uh, where he kind of laid out a timeline for this kind of stuff made me wonder, you know, is have they been rolling it out time and time again? And if that's the case, is now the moment that it's succeeding? Uh, are we like finally kind of getting traction with this kind of line of conversation and public acceptance of this issue because we're talking about it properly? We we still get occasionally, you know, bad interviewers and interviews that play the X Files music and stuff like that, but it's changed. It's few and far between now. The conversation seems to be serious now, by and large, a lot more so than it used to be. So I'm I'm curious. That that's something I'd love to ask Jay about. Um, oh, just on that, Dan. I'm just for those on the YouTube who are seeing me turn away, but for the audio folks, you'll have got no idea. Um, HR McMaster made a comment. So HR McMaster uh, is again Army uh, U.S. National Security Advisor, Army veteran. Um, lecturer, um, he's a fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, um, really serious dude. Um, he was a 26th assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. So again, highly qualified, kind of came out of nowhere. And in his interview, Dan, that I have zero details of because I forgot to write it down. Um, it wasn't a UFO interview necessarily, but he, I'm sure I'll find it. Yeah. Um, 
he was asked about the the UFO topic in conversation and basically said on this interview that, well, yeah, there's some really interesting things. I don't know. Can you get the quote, Dan? Have you got it handy? Um, um, I can pull it up now. I've also got it. If okay, this goes any longer, I'll remove it. But have you got it? Yeah. Oh, no, I don't. I thought you said you had uh, it. No, 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 no. So he was... Do, 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 do. Um, well, yeah, while, while you have a gander, the, the reason... One of the reasons I think this is a really important statement is because we've heard previous directors of national intelligence like John Radcliffe and acting directors of national intelligence like Avril Haines speak about the UAP issue and talk about it in a really just profoundly serious way. And I don't think people have really appreciated where they were coming from. John Radcliffe was, you know, he spoke when he was out of the role. But he said that there were things that they couldn't explain. He didn't downplay the issue when he was asked about it. He he emphasized the importance of it and the weirdness of it. Avril Haynes kind of danced around it a little bit, but yeah. finished what she said at an event by saying, you know, that some of these things are just, you know, essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, but some of these things are essentially just known like adversaries and things like that. And then the thing she finished with, which set UFO tweets on fire, was saying that, there may be some things that come extraterrestrially, which is yeah, kind of a mouthful, but it points yeah. to a certain direction, doesn't it? That they they keep seeding this little thought into the conversation that these aren't normal, prosaic things that we're seeing. These are anomalous, and they cannot explain them. Yeah, his comment, um, he was on the Times list of the top 100 most influential people in 2014. That's reasonable achievement, I'm sure. Um, and as a former NSA advisor to the president, like I said, um, he, his comment was, and I can't go, I can't remember the interview, but it wasn't a UFO one. But he basically said there are phenomena that have been witnessed by multiple people that are just inexplic inexplicable by the science available to us. That's a pretty conclusive comment, you it's know. Heavy, right? <laughs> not not just like we can't identify because that can still be Russian, Chinese, whatever, right? It's by the science available to us. So that's that's a pretty telling comment um, from HR McMaster, uh, General HR McMaster. So, um, and it's not. I know Matthew Pines, when I was speaking to him, had commented a little bit about a uh, a big personality or presence coming forward yeah. to, to talk about the topic towards the end of the year. He said almost immediately online, "This was not what he was talking about." So. If anyone was curious with Matthew Pines when I spoke to him, if you haven't heard it, go and listen because because Matthew was great. Um, different voice in the UAP scene. Uh, yeah, he said this is not what he was talking about. But you can imagine that that caused a little ripple, at least, which is pretty cool and uh, the whole UFO UAP topic. And we all know ripples build up. You, you know, sometimes uh, they become waves. And this is the kind of feeling that I'm getting that anyone that's been in this subject following since 2017 you know since to the stars academy of science and technology did its thing um these these ripples have been building more and more qualified very qualified very senior people who absolutely would know about this stuff are coming forward to tell us and kind of echo that obama comment where he said you know there are things in the sky that we can't explain essentially you know yeah. patterns and things like that and saying that we don't have the science to explain it as well like Dear God, like science is so advanced. America puts so much money into its military that the sensors they have are insane. They see things that you know we we wouldn't even think about kind of making sensors for. And yet they're saying it falls outside of what they're able to kind of understand well with the science that we have available to us today. That's yeah. a big statement, a really big statement, because the science we have available to us, to us today isn't solid atoms and things like that. It's quantum. It's cutting edge stuff. So if this stuff doesn't fit, what the hell is it? Yeah, his, his language was incredibly uh, deliberate. And, and Dan, before we get to some listener stuff, just a few talking points from the, the recent weaponized episode with George Knapp cool. and Jeremy Corbell. Um, the, the episode was largely actually around Calares, um, highlighted in Luis Elizondo's book, Story from Brazil, 1977, where... Essentially, we're not going to do a whole episode here on Calares. I've got um, 
researcher, Tiago Ticetti, who was on that episode, is coming on with me in a couple of weeks. It was meant to be on a few weeks ago, and we just couldn't get the exact date and time together um, arranged. He's uh, one of Brazil's foremost researchers um, on the UAP topic, especially now AJ Javard passed away um, in the last year or so. But he was talking about Calares, which Luis Elizondo, like I say, mentioned in Imminent, where basically for, for a period of time, people who lived in Calares were attacked and hunted by UFOs, UAP, you know, laser-like beams hitting people, not only sucking their blood, but also taking iron from their blood, um, rendering many of them anemic. Um, people quoted seeing blood leaking from them, like something physical was in the light beams, potentially. Um, it seemed unprovoked. There are reports that the, the Brazilian military at the time basically observed the events and filmed footage. Yep. Um, they... they basically observed and never helped to see what was happening, which is really interesting. Medical records disappeared from hospitals. Officially, there is one death recorded, but unofficially reports are there seems to be many more attributed to the events, which is really interesting. Um so I thought that was that was pretty pretty cool to see that highlighted by Jeremy and George as an event and I'll have Tiago on as well. Um just just on the Calares story, Dan, your thoughts on on that as an event? Calares is insane as far as ufo story goes like insanely great to talk about because so much happened and there's so much recorded by the government you can even go to the official government website of brazil and they have a page there of the night of the ufos and it talks about all of this so they, they've at least put up a lot and tried to be transparent about it what went missing that they weren't able to pour up or whether they are actively hiding things in the modern day i i couldn't say because we, we just don't know right and it makes me wonder if this is happening in Calares, there's no way it hasn't happened anywhere else. So what UFO events have we not heard about that are similar? Are there events that kind of have similarities that, that could be kind of drawn into the same pool? And it makes me think of, so in an episode of the Unidentified, they, they talk about uh, an Italian helicopter being attacked by a UAP, that one of its wings was damaged and it had to land. This was a series of events in, uh, I'm going to mess up the pronunciation of this now, but it, it was a, a one street town in the north of Sicily called Caneto di Caronia. And over the course of an extended amount of time, there kept being kind of like mysterious fires. Um, and people reported kind of these weird happenings, kind of like poltergeist kind of activity. And a lot of it sounds similar to Colares. And there's kind of room for, you know, if there were orbs and things like that, it's never been talked about, um, but there was a picture shown in Unidentified that showed an object seemingly following the helicopter before the collision happened. Yeah. When you kind of read about this event, you find that the government investigated and there, there was a source that kind of came from off the coast in the middle of the water. And, you know, Calares is kind of, you know, it's not very far from, from the coast. And I, I wonder with the connection to water with UAP, Lou emphasized it in imminent again, if, you know, the source of it was something anomalous. Um, and that's another event then suddenly that's similar. One thing about Calares uh, that really intrigues me is when you go back through the records and you look at kind of the, the reports, some of the early reports are just kind of, they're encounters, but there are no injuries. And it seems like the injuries began when one person was confronted with it, with an orb, and they pulled their gun on it, and the person was attacked. And then from mm -hmm. that point on, the attacks kind of seemed to get more numerous. And I know plenty of people kind of express concern with the, the military engaged in these things. You know, maybe, maybe just seeing a gun kind of presents a threat to something that's not necessarily from here or you know could be from here but isn't isn't human and it kind of it gives me the chills to think about because we are very you know there's a lot of war around the world i don't think everyone is violent i don't think everyone's first action with kind of altercations would be to cause war but certainly a lot of governments in the world are committing wars against each other and it's worth being cognizant of how that looks to something outside of humanity, that it would make us look like a violent warlike species. And with Secret Machines uh, third book, you know, of the Gods Man and War series, War coming out soon, I'm I'm really intrigued 
to, to hear people's thoughts around that because we're essentially being misrepresented if violence is the first thought because like i say most people you know you're not violent uh all the people i know in my life aren't violent it just seems to be kind of a military thing because the world is very militaristic these days is that human nature or or isn't it and yeah I, i'd like to invite the audience to kind of comment on that and how how they feel that it maybe doesn't represent humanity in the best light invite invite challenge so um, the the night of the UFOs thing is different to Calares. That was nineteen eighty six. Um, oh, that's Calares right. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Um, just in case anyone's looking them up, um, night of the UFOs was like twenty twenty UFO sightings or twenty odd UFO that's sightings right. across Brazil. Um, but Tiago talks about that as well on the on the episode with George and Jeremy. Um, so just on that, right? Because I was going, I was going to bring this up with you. So. Is there a chance, you know, like when you speak to people about the UFO topic and they go, oh, it's always in America. So essentially you've got the the conversation that the UFO phenomenon is very US centric. And then I think it's fair to say South America, especially countries like Brazil, Peru, Mexico, have a rich history of UFO, UAP sightings, encounters, um, conversations, you know, tapestry texts going back hundreds of years and whatnot, that it just is the case that it's because there are bases for UAP or UFOs in the water around the continental US and South America. Do you think it's just that simple? Because it would point to that for me, that whatever it is, or whatever some of this is, which comes on to my second point in a moment, which you mentioned, is it's based in the water and there are just bases all around that the Americas. It's, it's possible. And when we kind of follow it back in South America, a lot of it is kind of, I wouldn't say disguised because I'm not sure how intentional it is. It's just the framework that you have. But a lot of it is kind of painted with religious approaches that, you know, we, we hear about, I know Fatima isn't there, but there are plenty of kind of events like that in South America that are seen as Marian apparitions. But actually when you look into them, it's orbs of light and things like that. And people just use in the framework of the time to talk about them. <laughs> Mary, well, let, let me come in then, Dan, with my, my second kind of okay. point on that, because you mentioned about the, the military and is it a human thing that there's violence with this phenomenon and whatnot. I don't think we can say that. I think there can be an element of it. But I think what the military encounter is one specific aspect of this phenomenon. I don't think they have ET in craft buzzing their ships. I think the Tic Tacs and stuff like that are empty. I think those are kind of drones, observation, whatever they are. Um, if if what the Omaha and the Russell and all these kind of events were indeed kind of UAP, I don't think they are manned, if we can say that, or, you know, they don't have biologics inside of them. Like they have um, remote control. Yeah, uh, something like yeah. that. Yeah, like they're just little little drones, but for something else. Um, so that would make sense to me. But then if you've got people who, like Whitley Strieber and others, are having really negative experiences, then there is a violent aspect, whether they think they're being violent or not, mm -hmm. just from what they do. So th there there are there are people who have really unpleasant experiences in this in this UFO UAP conversation, especially abductees and experiencers will tell you that not all of them but but some um but i do get what you mean where is it do we draw this and i wonder then is it that and this isn't necessarily the the, the situation for Calares because we don't know necessarily what the objects were um but if if we provoke are these things automatically set to defend themselves yeah or attack back so that well that makes sense we, we hear that the orbs kind of have colors, right? That they shift yeah. between colors. And I think Lou suggested they might be modes. from like Which does not help me as a colorblind person. You know, that. <laughs> oh, yeah, like like, ah, no, don't touch it. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, so really, then, the issue might be communication. And the problems with communication. You know, we, we show a gun, but we're not using it. It's just, uh, you know, we're cautious. But then we kind of invite that kind of challenge and attack or, or that yep. defensive kind of mode. And like you say, it might not be intentional. It might just be 
a part of the technology. And I think Lou's spoken about this before. You know, what was the analogy he used? That if you stand behind like the jet engine of a 747, you're going to get hurt, but yeah. it's not designed to hurt you. So it's kind of a, if we don't understand each other's intent properly, then we're, we're going to have these teething issues. And I remember as well, uh, I, I did an interview a while back with Michelle Fournay about whale song and 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 Lou submitted a question for me to ask her about how would you communicate with a species that was non-verbal and it really intrigued me you know the answer was great but just asking that question Lou asking that question really intrigued me because yeah if, if something can't speak English if it doesn't have even our sense of up and down left and right like these things that we see are really basic then how how do you even start to say we come in peace you know yeah I was thinking before talking about the orbs and colors like traffic lights. You know, if you're sitting at a red light and you choose to get through it, is it the light that's hurting you or is it the fact you've kind of not obeyed what you should have been like doing? That. But, you know, different people, different countries, not reading the situation at the time, go ahead and something else hits you. And it's a consequence yeah. of not not reading the situation. But um, and to jump on your point one. as well, sorry to interrupt, you like, know. What what if the colors to us don't look the same as the colors to them? And that that's the point of contention. You know, you, you joked about being colorblind, but it's a very real thing we have to speak to, to think about. Uh, you, you know, we we thought dogs saw in black and white at one point, and now we know that they don't necessarily see. There are other animals that see different parts of the spectrum. So what if that's the problem? You you kind of it's hard to even fathom the issue when it's things like that, that you need to solve. And if you can't even identify the issue or the question uh you know i don't mean to sound hopeless it's, it's really intriguing but it's gonna take work a couple of comments dan from uh nap and corbell and that one that i thought were really interesting three of them particularly um george knapp emphasizes one the importance of the new york times article of 2017 but highlights very quickly and this was them talking about the the stratton book coming out and osap and atip um, he says there were mistakes in that article that have never been cleared up or corrected. He does highlight, for example, ATIP never got $22 million. Sure. OSAP did, which is very fair, but they've never gone back and corrected that. But he seemed to, emphasize, to indicate there are other inconsistencies or inaccuracies in that article. And I wonder, is that George Knapp hinting at there may be parts of the story for whatever reason that Lou Elizondo has got wrong or maybe haven't mattered yet just to get the story out and maybe come clear in time. I'm not too sure on that. Um, as part of that, the second point was George Corb uh, George Jeremy Corbell says to Knapp. George Corbell. They, George no Corbell. Fusion. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy Knapp. Um, basically, uh, Corbell says to Knapp, is one of the primary reasons OSAP even existed was it to take custody of an intact craft from Lockheed Martin and bring it in through the front door, which is why the large hangar was set up, which is why the $22 million was provided, and that Bigelow and co. were looking to basically take custody of this craft from Lockheed Martin. They were going to divest themselves of it. Um, and George, ba George Knapp basically says that looks very likely, yeah, that Lockheed was going to give OSAP a craft. So that was one of the whole reasons the OSAP ever existed. So even forgetting ATIP, which was obviously what came of it, OSAP was there to take custody of a craft and it just never got there, which is why things kind of maybe went the way they did, along with a whole load of other reasons. I would be really interested to see if that comes up at all in Stratton's book. That would be a huge talking point. Yeah, and, and Lou touched on it in his book. He, he spoke about it. Um but it wasn't an intact craft. They just said material, right? Yeah. And material can be anything from, you know, a tiny shred of something to yeah. a full-size craft. So, yeah. you know, there's vagueness there and that's not a lie. That's just being vague to kind of talk about it. But Lou asked some very important questions, I, I think, and and about, you know, why, why the sudden change of heart? Why suddenly would they want to give this stuff over? And it's been suggested that Lockheed in kind of, that they realized essentially that this was problematic, that they were in custody of it and they wanted to get shot of it so that fingers yep. wouldn't be pointed at them when it came and came around. We can't confirm that because we haven't heard from anyone at Lockheed. Um, but it's it's very intriguing that uh that Steve Justice 
the the guy who was in charge of Skunkworks, the more experimental part of you know Lockheed there, um, was involved into the stars along with you know Tom posted. He didn't share the person's name. He was identified as Eric in the post. He was another person from Skunk Works at one of Blink 182's shows, along with Steve Justice. So there seems to be something to this. Lockheed seemed to want to get this out for some reason, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it going forward. But really intriguing, right? Yeah, and Ross Coulthard had talked about that as well, didn't he? A little while ago, mm -hmm. that there were private contractors, aerospace companies, rumored to be Lockheed that were looking to divulge themselves of this when That's right. that whole legislative piece was coming out and they were talking about giving them 180 days to tell them who had what and um, stuff like that. So, um, and, and if I other, remember correctly, yeah. it was said that it was the CIA that shut it down. And that's really, I mean, we've had John Ramirez from the CIA talking about this stuff and a, a lot, all roads seem to lead back to this organization um, that has no oversight that you know even someone in charge of the cia might not know all of the programs going on underneath them uh, something could have been set in motion years ago uh, i don't want to talk out of turn and get my phones tapped but maybe you know the cia would say that all you hear is all hearsay dan uh, <laughs> i wish someone would one. tell me what was right <laughs> that's the one um and thirdly uh corbell asks nap if osap had access to the brazilian military's alleged 22 hours of footage footage filmed in calares um and nap said it seemed genuinely he isn't sure and if it is there it's locked away since osap yeah, became a tip and whatnot um but he would love to try and dig away at that and try and find out from the people they know that are involved maybe with the program still going on in investigations that is there that footage there from 77 that allegedly the the brazilian military filmed that was potentially taking custody of so that would be pretty cool to see as well It'd be um, amazing. For, for yeah. you, what would you prefer? So say that footage is going to come out anyway. Would you prefer it to be a leak or would you prefer it to be an official government release? And why? Um, would it be the same footage? Yeah. As no, as... Nothing changes, no shortening of durations, nothing like that? No, same same footage. Um, I wouldn't care then. Okay. <laughs> I, I suppose for the greater good, you'd want it to be official, but if it was quickness then but if, if corbell and nap release that through themselves there's always going to be question marks because of custody and everything else i get that but for do you know what at this point though from a government point of view there's that whole element of well why are we trusting quote unquote the government yeah. um the government's a big thing and the government's not one person it's a lot of people and a lot of apartments and a lot of agendas that are all working some against each other some for each other um yeah we, we could do with some kind of independent UAP review board. Contact your senators, tell them you support UAP Disclosure Act. It's in there. And then we get it, and people don't like who's on the board. And then they all pick Yeah, it. probably. <laughs> um, so we'll see how long this next part goes, talking listener questions, folks. Um, but that may be the end of part one, likely the end of part one, because that's been a good hour now. Um, we've been going, talking through all the, those kind of news points. So thank you very much, folks, if you're if you're leaving us there for a day or two. Um, and then we'll get the rest of the content out for you with the listener questions. If you're on the paid feeds, um, then as a thank you, here's the second part straight away for you. And, you know, Scooby-Doo, doodly-doo, doodly-doo, we're still here. Um, Dan, I've not gone through all these questions and whatnot. Some of them may, they, they kind of jump all over. A couple of things may repeat, I'm not sure. Um, sure. But thank you to everyone who at very short notice sent stuff in. Sorry if I've not gotten to yours, but um, we'll kick off. Jonathan says, uh, hi, Andy, I've, I haven't read Lou's book yet, but I'm intrigued by Lou's comments on Ross Coulthard's show regarding there being two craft at Roswell and one flying away. I've never heard this before and haven't heard any comments on it since the interview. Can you and Dan discuss this on your breakdown? Um, Dan, I know we touched on this in the review of the media tour, I think, but uh, to repeat myself, I've I've heard before, not from like official sources and, you know, secret sources, but I had just heard in over the years that there were multiple crashes at Roswell. Not necessarily one flew away, but I'd also heard that there was a crash and then the second crash was our second craft was trying to retrieve the craft that crashed. God, that's a tongue twister for me. Um, <laughs> but obviously, all in this, it seems like there may have been a second craft. This isn't new for me. 
Um, it's not common in the general Roswell story told to the public. It says something crashed at Roswell, bodies were recovered, bits of the craft were recovered, it crunched up like tinfoil, folded back out, and that that's the Roswell story to 99.9% .9 of people. But I had heard that before, but no real detail around it, to be honest. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a number of sources, right? Uh, we, we all agree the story is that something crashed at Roswell. Um, the two craft thing in Lou's book really intrigued me because there are rumblings of it, but uh, th there's never been anything kind of definitively spoken by someone in authority. And it, it made me think of, I went and looked up, so the, the material, the bismuth magnesium that was tested recently, uh, uh, you know, so the stars bought it from Linda Malm Howe and, and gave it to the army and they tested it and said that it wasn't anomalous. When that was sent to Art Bell um, and became known as, you know, uh, what was it? I'm, I'm forgetting now. I'm drawing a blank. Um, Arts Parts, that was it. Um, yeah. There was a letter with it. And that letter detailed that basically that it, it wasn't that, you know, they crashed into each other or anything like that. It was that there was a UFO in the in orbit that got hit by a meteor that had to drop down into our atmosphere, but that the meteor kind of damaged its atmospheric flight capability. And when it tried to switch it on, it ended up crashing. And that there was essentially, you know, a, a bunch of occupants thrown from the craft that died. One that was very much alive. And it was all transported to another airbase. And the, the transport, the plane that was taking it, disappeared. And that, that really intrigued me because that happens in the TV series Taken that Steven Spielberg was involved in, in making. You know, they transport this UFO halfway to the location. They, they get stopped by another UFO and everything and everyone that was there disappears. Mm. The retrieval thing makes sense. It's what we would do, right? Uh, if something crashed, we would try and go and retrieve it. Uh, I know that's kind of anthropomorphic of me. It's very human based. But. It, it rings true to me, you know, that there are two. And we we often, not often, but um, we, we heard Tom DeLong before kind of say that when something happens, the government kind of want two things to, to happen. One, that a cover story comes out, a mundane one, and that two, a conspiracy theory happens. And that actually, they're the two things people talk about, but there's a third question that no one asks. And I feel like this has kind of happened with Roswell. We all talk about one craft crashing. We all talk about the mogul balloon. That's our conspiracy and our mundane. Mm -hmm. But what if the third possibility is that, you know, two craft crashed and no one's asking about it. No one's digging on it. So when you send in, you know, a FOIA email, for example, kind of saying, hey, tell me about the craft that crashed at Roswell. On a technicality, they can go, oh, a craft didn't crash at Roswell. And therefore, yeah. you don't kind of get any further. Uh, it's, yeah, re really intriguing. Uh, amazing story. I don't know why it's not a movie yet. Uh, let, let's, yeah, let's let's get rolling. I want to see a movie of that. <laughs> I have never seen Taken. Have you not? No. You, I've you, written so, down. I need to watch it. Like, I need to watch it. It's, it's kind of, I mean, I, I'm not sure what streaming service it's on but i can get it to you anyway no no problem I, i've got yeah, it yeah yeah um and i i think you'd really enjoy it and i'd be really intrigued to see if susan enjoyed it too because it's very drama based she won't watch it i guarantee she might... tell you right now like she won't watch what, it. what if i send her a letter pleading i'm like susan please please watch this <laughs> she'll sit on her phone scrolling through facebook while it's on maybe looking up now and again to, to check what, what if we feed. break it into five minute episodes <laughs> If you set it in Hollywood and have the Sunset Boulevard or Selling Sunset Girls present it, then maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, but moving on, we have Chase got in touch, Dan. Uh, I'm interested in why Lou Elizondo in his book didn't include the submarine oil derrick incident or the Navy Frogman missile retrieval incident in the book. Why only in interviews? What else is left out of the book? It sounds like we need another book of just the experiences he can share. That is a really fair point, actually. Obviously, we've, we've talked about the, the oil derrick incident, where if folks haven't heard any of these yet, on Rogan, he talked about a huge city block-sized USO passing by an oil rig oil derrick out at sea. Yeah. Um, and also the Navy Frogman missile retrieval is a, a story Lou's told on multiple podcasts over the years where, um, was it off Cuba? Was it Cuba? I can't remember. 
something like that, where basically at sea they were trying to retrieve a missile that had landed in the ocean. And as they sent down like the frog divers, they frantically wanted back up because something came up and out the ocean and basically swallowed the missile, some kind of craft. Um, and they were all terrified that this S thing just came down up. was the phrase, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and it was a if I remember correctly, it was a dummy missile. But it's beside the point. If if anything's yeah. coming up to kind of take these things, uh, that's that's crazy. Yeah. Dan, that's the conspiracy story, the whole... It was a dummy missile, it doesn't matter. Yeah, we're yeah, talking about yeah. this thing that came to get it. Yeah, it doesn't matter, because it was a dummy missile. You're totally still negating the fact something has come up out that water uh, yeah. to, to get this missile. So that is an interesting point, though, that if Lou has put... Well, we, we can definitively say, actually, just from that, Lou hasn't put everything in the book, because yeah. those stories aren't there. Why do you think that is... I mean, one thing is going to be time, right? You, you know, you can't just keep people. And, and we did say in our, I forget where to, and we did like three and a half hours of content on his book, but somewhere in there, we, we said we'd love to see another book from him just with these stories in. And for, for me, I think the ones that he included are the ones that the public can go online and they can find more information about. Um, you know, they're not obscure cases that no paperwork exists on a, a just stories that are told they're cases that have video government officials kind of talking about them photographs yeah. things like that so that that's what i would say um yeah i i still i still think given the way some information's inserted in there it could have just been like even a, a chapter or it could have been tagged along with you know when he talks about roswell Calares, rendlesham you know those those could have fit in there quite nicely, but like you say, maybe there's a whole Rima stuff. Time is no doubt. He's been his publisher probably said to him, you know, you've got six months to write this book. Um, so fair enough. Like, um, maybe not everything, but I would be interested to hear more of those. But yeah, yeah fair, fair, very fair question, Chase. Um, Human Neutrino asks, do you think Lou's book and media tour will help the passage of the UAP DA? Like, will it act as a suppository, Dan, to the UAPDA? <laughs> like, the way I've kind of read that. Um, but um, I I don't think it will have an impact. Um, not not a substantial one, positively or negatively. I think, I think some of the folks involved in that have probably read the book or maybe had advanced copies of the book, who knows. Um, and, yeah, I, I don't think it will hinder things. But maybe if anything a small positive but i think the uapda um lou elizondo's impact on that is largely his help in writing the uapda and putting those things together publicly in the background and all that work he's done um behind the scenes so don't know what you think dan on that yeah i i just say that in terms of you know there's there's a call to action in lou's book to kind of speak to your senators and let them know that you want to know the truth on this and lose plugging away on interviews and a media tour and literally we found out the other day i think yesterday he announced it that he's going to be doing a bunch of events around the us um i don't want to go through them all but if you go to lou alessandro's website um or his twitter or x you you can see all the dates there are six dates and he said watch out for dates in the uk and things like that so I feel like he's trying to kind of get people to be more active in talking to their senators whether it will be successful or not, I don't know, but uh, there's no harm in trying. And yeah, as, if it gets more people talking and taking this more seriously and wanting transparency on this issue, then that's a good thing. It remains to be seen whether that will have an impact on the UAP DA. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, new uh, listener to the podcast, Peter Earnshaw, has sent in a couple of questions. Hi, Peter. <laughs> I, um, I, I see what you did there. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Um, so Peter asks, uh, is Arrow ever going to be anything other than a smokescreen? Kind of touched on that, but I don't know at this point. I think I had kind of given up on it. Um, I was intrigued to see Lou, Gary Nolan, and others sort of not completely give up on it, but it's almost like... I get the feeling this has to be a last chance for it to really do or anything or contribute. Um, otherwise, it just has to go away. Um, Dan, you, your thoughts on that one? Anything yeah. other than a smokescreen? Pretty much largely agree with what you said. You know, right right now it's acting like Blue Book did, Project Blue Book, and just obfuscating. It has a chance to turn that around. If, if it doesn't, it's going to fall out of public favor and 
when the senators just hear a complaint and we're talking about you know efficiency wasting money government uh, overspend then arrow is going to be a target for that kind of stuff and and i can see it going away um witness testimony from michael this is also from peter by the way um witness testimony from michael herrera and assertions by the inimitable dr greer Stephen Greer, that is, folks, strongly suggest elements of the US military industrial complex have indeed successfully back engineered alien tech and command ARVs. Um, that, what's ARV again? Anomalous uh, replication, via, alien replication, via alien, alien. That's the one. Um, how it's likely, do, yeah, <laughs> right, there's so many, so many acronyms, folks. <laughs> how likely do you think this is? Also, how likely is it, Lou J. Halputoff? know this and are working towards disclosing this fact good question and the follow-up um so dan i'll let you answer that one first how likely do you think that is that essentially the u.s government has reversed alien technology and is using this technology i would say it's more likely that they're using aspects of the technology i don't think you know got a full, my... full triangular craft yeah. flying about manned by people yeah i don't think they would have perfectly replicated it in, in the sense of, you know, if we think about cargo cults, they they tried building watchtowers and planes out of bamboo. It, it's not going to work. They don't have the fundamental technology to make these vehicles. Yeah. However, there are aspects of them, like, not to say that fiber optic came from them, but, you know, that was the accusation in uh, the day after Roswell and that kind of stuff. But if they found a certain aspect of it useful, they would start working on that, and it would kind of give them paths to kind of walk down and Lou mentions in his book about uh, an Abrams tank being damaged like a, a hole punctured in the side of it and that it's in insane that that was able to happen because we don't have anything in our arsenal that could do that and then you connect that to kind of Havana syndrome and the energy weapons they talk about which you know they're kind of speed of light weapons or soul weapons um these are things that could be you know facets of that technology that could be being used if you walk into an alien spaceship and you see a weapon that could be useful down the road you're gonna kind of try and replicate that um mm -hmm. and the more of that those aspects you build up the closer you are to replicating the overall technology so that's the pathway to doing that i don't think they've replicated a whole ship but i think they've probably made technology based on principles at work in that ship have you gone back and forward on that in the past? Because I've I've had yep. times where I've thought maybe we have something, and you get those stories, don't you? Where we have ships, and you hear this in some experiencers' accounts that there are like humans and non-humans uh -huh. aboard the same craft. Even you hear about you know strange-looking military uniforms where you've essentially got. And it sounds like an episode of Star Trek, basically, doesn't it? Where you've got humans walking about with humanoid-like figures. Yes. all on board the same craft um drinking at gaia's bar all that kind of stuff um, but, but what's to say that those humans aren't the hybrids that they've been yeah and, you, and you know, aren't like, even from here yeah yeah exactly um yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and another question from a new contributor, Peter. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, he says, Lou's documentation of remote viewing, orbs, and implants definitely moves the conversation towards the more woo elements of the phenomenon and away from nuts and bolts flying saucers. Do you both feel more able to accept the more extreme woo elements such as channeling non-human non -human intelligence, the summoning of orbs by Chris Bledsoe, Bled Bledsoe, Jesus Christ, smoking dog-headed men, and dino beavers? I mean, I've never really had an issue too much with the woo anyway. Um, yeah. as, as I said before, I've, I've kind of done a little remote viewing and tried it out and found that, you know, what well, it's that Arthur C. Clarke quote, right? Like anything sufficiently advanced looks like magic uh, when it could just be technology. So I, I don't kind of get rid of the woo. And I think this is kind of where the conversation is going, kind of more to that woo stuff. But without the groundwork, it's going to feel far-fetched if we don't talk about the groundwork. As to channeling, um, again, I've touched on this before. When you read the work of Kiel, uh, he, he found that channelers would give him the same information that the extraterrestrials or phenomenon would give him. And for him, that was a, a confirmation that this stuff was all one and the same kind of phenomenon working in different ways through different people. And we often talk about language and how one country will name one thing, 
and then another country will call the exact same thing something else. So I, I think a lot of this woo stuff is just kind of down to that. Why is getting crossed, things not really being understood, and us kind of grasping a, an elephant in a dark room and grabbing different parts of it. So let me ask you, Dan, then, if if the, the UFO conversation, if A is right at the beginning and Z is progress, so let's use the alphabet, where, where for you, with Z being disclosure, like full confirmation, in the conversation, can you start talking about dog-headed men, dino beavers, creatures crawling out of portals, that real extreme element of the conversation that no doubt general public total turn off if you say UFOs and you get them in involved and then very quickly you're like, do you want to hear this cool story about something crawling out a portal in the desert? They'll be like, uh, I'm, I'm good, no thanks. Yeah, it's, it's Where difficult. is that in the conversation? Where is that in the alphabet? It's, it's difficult to know where people's red lines are, isn't it? Well, let me um, ask then, sorry, just to caveat that. Is sure. it a case then that disclosure isn't Z? And if disclosure is like Q and the alphabet, that that conversation actually has to come after? I feel like the conversation about that kind of stuff, I mean, we, we've seen it happen already and, and we can see it challenging people, but it kind of comes part and parcel with talking about the phenomena, you know, the, the wolves smoking cigarettes at the end of people's gardens and the hitchhiker effect and things like that. What we need to shift is our understanding as to how and why these things happen. And if, for example, say, when we get to H, H is a conversation about our brains and how our brains make things up uh, when it struggles to, to kind of understand something, that it, it contributes to that Q or that Z. So I feel like it kind of needs to be laced in along the way, and I feel like it is being laced in along the way. But I also appreciate that it's really goddamn challenging to kind of incorporate and properly appreciate. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why we might not in our in you and i in our lifetime get full disclosure because we can't internalize these kind of ideas without them seeming outlandish but in the you know early 1900s quantum stuff seemed outlandish yet now we talk about it every day it's in tv shows they just throw it around you you know yeah. um and and i feel like it's just going to take a while for people to to get past that and maybe it's a generational thing even like i suppose the way i try and think of these things or frame these things um it reminds me a little bit this analogy might be quite loose and i'll delete it if it's crap right but <laughs> in, in in wrestling there was this thing where when a wrestler came to the wwf back in the day and they gave them their gimmick or their name they would always try and sell it to them in the sense of can you imagine that name headlining wrestlemania like the big sure. event so like and there's some names where people look back and go this guy was never going to be the guy but they always sold it that you could be the guy regardless of what your name was but if you were the red rooster and your gimmick was to walk about and you know clock like a rooster are you really going to be fighting hulk hogan in the main event at wrestlemania seven or five probably not um yeah. it's just it's just not going to happen with that name that's not going to enter into the conversation so if you've got Luis Elizondo, this is what I would do is right now is again at the forefront of the conversation. It was David Grush last year. So let's put Lou on big, uh, on 60 Minutes, right? Let's say there's a really serious announcement this week. Lou Elizondo back on 60 Minutes, huge segment. Can you see Lou sitting right now and talking about smoking dogmen or dino beavers or that? how do you think that would then land with the public because i think that would set the conversation back quite away yeah i, I mean you're being gentle there it would set the conversation on fire wouldn't it it, it would be yeah. a reset button people just wouldn't take it seriously so yeah. I, I don't think that kind of stuff is going to come from lou i think it's got to come from a place where it can be explained so like for example if you had a, a neuroscientist that came out and explained because of this that we now understand that we didn't before you might see dogman and then we can kind of apply it with a different context if that makes sense i think that's mm. where it's going to kind of come in yeah 
Cool. Good question, Peter. Thank you. Do get in touch yeah, again. Yeah. Really appreciated your contributions, Peter. Um, and, and welcome as well to the new yeah. listener, Peter. <laughs> Next up, uh, Carbon says, now the time, uh, now some time has passed and the dust has settled. Has your opinion on the believableness of Elizondo's story changed at all? Um, for me, I, I've not changed. I think there are still questions that are left unanswered. There are still some details that have changed a little bit over time. That's not an issue for me in terms of, like you said, Dan, the overall picture and the bigger story. Um, I think we'll see. I think right now I'm answering that question a little differently than I would have a few days ago because Jay Stratton's book is going to be the next installment. You know, If you ask me at the end of A New Hope, the Star Wars movie, do I think what's going to happen and if they made two more movies? I don't know that Darth Vader's looks father and, you know, Leia's his sister and all that kind of stuff yet. That's that's not came up. But, you know, well, after I've watched Empire Strikes Back, they didn't ask me about Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Spoilers, folks. Very sorry on that <laughs> one. And obviously, um, got to point out R.I.P. James L. Jones. Oh, yeah. One of the great voices of all time just passed away yesterday. So. Oh, house. Yeah, very sad to hear that. Um, but yeah, um, what's your thoughts on that then, Dan? The believableness I, of Elizondo's story? I, I would echo you. You know, I, I believe Lou. I, I don't think really belief comes into it anymore. Lou definitely did what he says he did. All of it? Um, most of it. And and I would say that the stuff that is kind of wishy-washy, you know, there are questions to be asked still, and there's stuff that I'm sure Lou himself would say, like, I can't talk about that yet because it wasn't cleared, or for other reasons, maybe the person that's the authority on that hasn't come out into the open yet and doesn't know if they want to. Um, but, yeah, I'd say as strong as ever, um, but there remain questions. Pretty much the same as you said. Yeah, I wonder on that, like, something you mentioned there about elements of the story maybe belong more to other people but yes. some of those folk have maybe said i don't plan on coming out or i don't want to come out and talk about it so feel free to say it was you you were there you know what happened fill in the gaps yeah um, and that way that part of the story can come out um and, and, and what happens that, in five years if they want to do their own book deal and you, you know suddenly they want to take ownership it's not a lie it's not a truth either, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, and again, this, go this goes back to the age old thing where so many folks in the UFO community um, will say that when disclosure comes, there's going to be like hearings similar to what happened in South Africa with the truth commissions and, and all that kind of stuff. And we'll jail people for being part of the cover up. Almost definitely will never happen because 99.9% .9 of the public will not care when there is confirmation of a non-human intelligence or alien presence, whatever it might be, no one's going to be going, right, first things first, let's get the grandkids of the people involved in Roswell up in court <laughs> to jail them. That's not going to happen. People won't care. So, yeah, just I always go back to that as a bit of a bugbear, I think. I think that is one of my yeah. now four-year bugbears doing this. Four-year bugbear. Yeah. Aspect it, of the it makes me think of the whole thing with the BBC. If you're not from the UK, this probably passed you by, but there was a famous guy, Jimmy Savile, who, uh, you know, it, it was said that he was involved in this pedophile ring and, and nothing ever came out while he was alive. And after he passed away, it all came out and people were outraged. But who do you put in jail? Like, are you going to drag his body up and chuck it behind bars just for a show? There's nothing to be done. And sure, that sucks. It would be great to hold people to account, but... Sadly, those people might have passed on. Yeah. And it would be liable for me to say Cliff Richard. So I wouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> you know, just throwing names out there. But yeah, <laughs> it, I was watching. Oh, total sidebar. And I wouldn't even go on about this long. Don't even respond back to this, Dan. But like on the Savile stuff, I can't remember what I was watching, but it was some, oh, I think it was um, some US comedian was talking about uh, Jimmy Savile and how the Brits didn't realize this guy was a pedophile. And it showed loads of clips and they kept going, this guy? this guy and it's you look back and go yeah that was so bad um but yes moving on swiftly um <laughs> before the bbc cancel me the hive um folks should keep their expectations low for the upcoming senate hearing gillibrand has already stated she's letting them explain cases to the public so we'll most likely see them selecting the most boring and prosaic cases to explain away while towing the usual nothing to see here no evidence of anything extraterrestrial or anything unusual. 
Meanwhile, none of the senators ask the important questions, such as if they're so easy to explain, then why is Arrow's solve rate so low? More of an opinion, but I, I can't disagree with that being a very likely outcome of, of what we see. And I, I suppose that's probably, Dan, similar to what you said earlier. Yeah, I, I would love for a senator or any official there to really pick up on those downplayed single lines in the reports where they say there seems to be one percent that are anomalous let's have an hour talking about those one percent but maybe the one percent doesn't have any data or something like that you know kirkpatrick has in the past made allusions to there being silver orbs that kind of fly around all around the world you, you know near military bases let's talk about that but we we need to tell our officials to ask those questions. We need to pressure them to ask those questions. That's the only way we're going to get those things. Um, yeah, we, we won't get those things otherwise. So contact your senators. Again, I keep saying it. <laughs> you know, I sound like a broken record, but this is the only way. That's the lever we have. So we, we need to use it. Uh, Jacob says, I saw a post on X where there is a new member of the UAP task force coming forward tomorrow on the Good Trouble show with Matt Ford. Could be important. Uh, Jacob, me and Dan discussed this very briefly before we hit record. It seems to be uh, potentially an analyst from the UAP task force coming forward from the photograph shared. It was someone in a skirt, so I'm guessing a female. Um, no more information at this time as to who or, who or what that's going to be about, but yeah, can I keep your eyes peeled? When this comes out, that'll have happened. So we can say, Dan, really interesting, wasn't it? Or Dan, um, a bit of a nothing burger, and I'll just delete as applicable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. do that. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. More people coming out from the UAPTF and talking is always encouraged. Uh, and maybe, maybe with this one person coming out, more people will come forward, so long as people don't attack them for not just laying everything out on the table. So let's hope the community behaves. <laughs> Do you think we just have to accept that if we want more people coming forward, we have to accept it's not always going to be the way we think it is and the stories yes. aren't always going to be what we want them to be? Um, and I, I look at in, uh, David Grush versus Jason Sands, how that all came about. And I'll say, folks, I'm I'm talking to Jason Sands and he's got some stuff going on just now that he's not came on. But there's two very different ways to present a story, Dan. I won't go back over that. We've talked about that. But yeah. There just might be elements to the way people come forward. There might be elements to the what people say that we just have to respect and realise will be part of that with a flood of folks coming forward that similar to, you know, when they make the Harry Potter movies, you've got an idea of reading the books, what that looks like in your head. You'll see someone else's vision put on a screen. You might love it. You might hate it. You might be indifferent, something in between. But it's going to be their interpretation and it's not always going to align to what yours is or your values or what you want them to say. But it's just yeah. it's part of the conversation and we kind of need to need it to happen. And and let's look at uh Gary Reed. You, you know, he, he was supposedly the guy not wanting this subject to, to kind of progress to its proper channels. And we would expect that to be, you know, some dark, mysterious force that just doesn't want, you know, maybe a member of the Collins elite that's downplaying it because it's religious. Turns out it's because he was having an affair with a subordinate. Really boring, um, but, you know, still relevant. Yeah, not necessarily boring, you know, some folks start to do their <laughs> thing, but yeah. Um, Terence uh, says, what would you like to see at the upcoming hearings? We've kind of touched on that. And when do you think we'll see David Grush back on the scene? Um, so when do you think we're going to see Grush back? I don't know. So I'm just going to say Christmas. No year given. I like that, Dan. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll say big, right? come back in five years and he's probably come back to <laughs> that point. Nice. I think between yeah. us, we've got that nail. Yeah. A little, a little callback. Yep. Um, summoning Wild Storm, cool name. So, um, do you think there's any value in a Jay Stratton book other than alternative views or opinions on the topic? Given that it'll just go through the usual Dopser process and considering Lou and Jay have worked together pretty closely, I can't see how it'll be radically different from Imminent other than having pre a tip info. Or do you think another book is just designed to add more weight to the process? Cheers, lads. Um, so, interesting thought on that just as I read the question, Dan, because I never read these before. Um, if it's going through the DOPSA process, and if anyone involved in that clearing of the book wanted to make Lou Elizondo look bad, 
they could do it by allowing some stuff through Dopser that they didn't allow Lou to get through yeah. Dopser. They could be very selective, couldn't they? And that's yeah. that's pure like thrown out wild speculation. But if you want to go a little bit conspiracy on it, it would be a way to do that. I still hope that Jay's book gives us exactly like you said there, Dan, um, his version of events, more of the OSAP story, like you say, the, those kind of timelines where, where Lou's book couldn't fill in, or maybe it wasn't Lou's story to tell. Um, I'd be really intrigued in that. But I can't imagine we're going to get the same story because it's not, because Lou's book was his story through his eyes and his experience. And yeah. I think there seems to be a lot of work Jay Stratton was involved in that Lou wasn't. So, um I can't see it being a bad thing at all. And I would hate for it to resort to being a mudslinging contest with, but it would be so weird having the same agent, the same company and all that stuff, like just putting out these books. And then, I mean, if they announce in the meantime, the third book in the series will be Susan Goff's memoir, then, <laughs> then I'd maybe worry. Um, but yeah, I don't think Cocktails so. Cocktails and confusion for Susan Goff. I think that'll be the title. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, anything to add to that, Dan? Uh, I, th I think it'll add more weight. It's more puzzle pieces. But I, I think as well, you, you said it was a conspiracy theory, but I think it's a very real possibility. We've seen the Pentagon change their statements three or four times now, maybe more. Um, so I, I think it's a real possibility that someone in Dobson could be pressured to maybe ob to, to add a little mud to the water. Um. Final question. I'm a little bit unsure of exactly what they mean, but we can talk around what I think it means. Um, is there anyone out there, from earnestly, is there anyone out there who can put together a cohesive structure about the Brazil UAP analysed materials scenarios? The general narrative is very enjoyable to listen to, but short on the evidence, it takes us to a conclusion. Um, thanks. Brazil analysed materials, Dan? I don't know if they just mean like Calares, Virginia, general Brazil yeah. UFO stories. That that sounds really specific to me. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm unprepared to answer, I would say, but I want to know more. So please elaborate and send in that question again. Shall we speak generally then, Dan, to finish off around that South American aspect, especially yeah. Brazil of the UFO phenomenon, because between Calares, um, Night of the UFOs, uh, Virginia, you have incidents where there are serious medical effects, people passing away, attacks, unprovoked attacks, um, all happening in a relatively short space of time. You're going from what seventy seven to Virginia was nineties, nineties. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, twenty year time frame. Let's just say, um, quite a few big events all happened in a pretty short space of time. For you, how strong are those cases in the overall UFO UAP subject? I I'd say really strong. But that partly comes from my personal experience in South America, kind of going and talking to people in Colombia uh, around, you know, La Pena de Huayca and kind of filming those lights on the mountain. They're, they're very casual about how they talk about things. And I feel like that only comes about when you're around something enough that you just, you don't think of it as something crazy anymore. I, I was even told that, you know, people would take picnics to the mouth of a, this cave and they'd sit and watch these lights pour out of the cave at certain times of the year. Uh, when when it's that normal for you, it, it it's very different to America and the UK, right, where this still is kind of this stigma to talk about it. So, yeah, like this huge weight on, on all the cases that happen in South America. And just to like throw a little tidbit in there that we, we didn't kind of add in, um, Tom DeLonge's Monsters of California towards the end. Uh, you know, the main character's dad is missing in the story and he's given a map that kind of clues it clues. Sorry, the main character is given a map that clues him in as to where his dad might be missing. And it's South America. It's Brazil. Uh, so between Lou, between, you know, Tom, people in TTSA, governments, actual UFO events, there seems to be some focus on South America. So I think it would be remiss for us to not hold that very seriously. Um, Dan, do you want to just very quickly plug, because you mentioned La Pena de Baica, you were in Colombia, Phenomenology, how people can watch that if they want oh, to yeah, check sure. it out. Yeah. So Phenomenology is actually up on YouTube for free now. So you can go, uh, if you just search Phenomenology in uh, on YouTube, you'll find it. And you can just watch our journey there, kind of investigate in various cases, some that we disprove, some that are fascinating and have no solution as of yet. So, yeah, go check it out. Um, let me know what you think. 
Um, and Dan, just to finish off, I want to just give a little shout out to one of the listeners who's been in touch with me for a long time, uh, has started up his own YouTube channel on the UFO topic and really keen to do something a little bit different. He's just put his first episode out. Uh, so if you check out Killing the Stigma, um, you'll see a kind of 40 minute random thoughts from, from one of the listeners, uh, Christian. So good luck to him um, yeah, on that. And just, uh, yeah. Uh, if folks ever want advice on that kind of stuff, I'm more than happy to give it, as, as Christian asked. But yeah, um, if anyone wants to go and see some more UFO, UAP content, check out Killing the Stigma and give him a like and, and comment as well. He's very open to some feedback on that. And that's us. So Dan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone that sent their questions in. You're awesome. Cheers, folks. And we'll speak to you very, very, very soon. Or not. Not sure yet. That is all for this episode. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. Apple and Spotify do make a huge difference to the algorithm. If you're checking the show on YouTube, please don't forget to like and leave a comment on here as well. Any sharing you do is very much appreciated on any social media platform. And finally, you can listen to shows ad-free and sponsor-free in their glorious full versions by subscribing for less than the price of a coffee on Apple, Spotify, just search That UFO Podcast Premium YouTube you can sign up and be a member or you can do that through patreon.com thank you very much for listening folks it wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer a little baroque and quite steampunk like Alice was playing bass for the parliament of folk the little fucker hovered right outside of my window and when I shoved out the screen he made it an issue 